This afternoon, I, I do think that you deserve my thanks for coming back, um, because there have already been uh, uh, a number of lectures today, and it's nice weather um, near the end of the conference, um, reasonably late. I even very briefly considered skipping the talk myself, um, <laughs> but here we all are. Um, I should say that uh, my lecture notes, um, the printed lecture notes, have been coming in installments. Um, and you probably have the first one. The second one was available on Tuesday. The third part is now available. So make sure you have all three parts of uh, my lecture notes. Now, I should begin by tying up um, a loose end from last time, um, which itself uh, was a loose end from the previous time about uh, torsion. So I said that there had been some odd torsion seen in Kuvana homology, and in particular in something that was not a torus knot. And then I completely failed to provide any evidence uh, whatsoever for that. Um, so let me now give you the, the reference. Um, here it is. So this is a, a paper by Joseph Prostitsky and uh, Radmila Sastanovic. And right at the end, um, they present a five braid, and that five braid um, has five torsion. And I believe that's a calculation that was done by uh, Alexander uh, Shumakovich. But there's the, the reference, but you should look right at the end of that paper. Okay, so last time we uh, looked at <coughs> uh, odd Kovana homology. And I uh, gave you the construction of it, and uh, then told you some, some properties. And today I want to return to um, ordinary um, Kovana homology. So today we'll return to that. And by now, I kind of hope that you've read that um, article by, or those few pages of the article by Barna Tan, which I uh, gave to you at the right in the first lecture, um, where the construction of ordinary Kovana homology was given. And you will see that it's um, very much like the construction I gave you for odd Kovana homology, um, but somewhat simpler. Um, so just to, in one and a half minutes, um, remind you of that, but I'm kind of assuming that you've, you've read it, um, so the construction, uh, the, the rule, um, whereas for odd Kovana homology we had one rule, um, remember we're trying to construct a functor from um, the set of, sorry, the, um, the, the Boolean lattice, the, the post set of subsets of the crossing set of some diagram to say abelian groups or vector spaces or somewhere, and the rule is we take a, a, a crossing. This time we don't care what, the, what the orientations are. So if, and given a subset here, so a subset of the set of crossings, if the crossing we see here is inside, sorry, is not in the set A, then we uh, do that. And if it's in the set, then we do that. So there's only one uh, way of or there, there's only one rule for um, resolving, uh, resolving crossings. Um, and then to such a, a subset of, of crossings, we assign, well, in old Kovana homology, we had exterior algebras. Now we take truncated polynomial algebras. So it's somewhat similar, but we take um, a variable for each circle in the smoothing we get by following this rule. And then um, we insist that for all such variables, gamma squared is, sorry, x squared is equal to zero. And then to um, finish defining a, a functor, we have to say what happens along edges 
So if this is an edge, then along an edge we see a local change, and that local change always looks like something, <clears throat> the way it's drawn here, something like this, changing to something like that. And as before, there are two cases, and in terms of these um, variables, it's just an algebra map, and it takes, if I label these by x, um, sorry, by alpha, alpha prime, this by beta, beta prime, then in this case, uh, we just take what's the, what's the associated map? Well, the associated map is um, x alpha goes to x beta. This is in the case where alpha is different from alpha prime. And x alpha prime also goes to x beta. And all the others um, just go to themselves. So any other gamma, x gamma goes to x gamma. So this is actually phrased a little differently from the way it's written down usually, but then that doesn't do any harm to see things in a slightly different notation, but it is only notation. And then there's something to say also about um, the case when alpha and alpha prime are um, from the same component, um, but I won't, uh, I won't go into that. Okay, so what I want to um, talk about first today um, is the topic of tangles. So tangles are very natural things to have in knot theory. It's nice to be able to glue things together. Um, and uh, there are very natural pieces you would try and glue together. Um, and these pieces, there, does that actually join up? Maybe it does. These pieces um, are, of course, tangles. So a tangle might just mean something like this. Or if I draw it over here, then I have a piece. It's not really the same circle, is it? I have a piece which looks like this, which is a tangle. And then if I erase this, from my initial diagram, um, then I can always get back what I had at the start by just moving this across and putting it in place. And the only reason that I'm laboring that point, that you can just move it across and put it into place, is that the point about tangles and how they compose to give you um, entire knots and links is that it's very easy to do geometrically. You just do what I said, you move it across. But then the nasty truth about this is that what's easy geometrically is very hard algebraically. And in fact, that's true in general. Anything that you can, if you can do something, gl some gluing procedure geometrically, then reflecting that algebraically can be very difficult. Um, so there are uh, problems that um, you have to you, you have problems that you have to resolve if you want to um, develop a kind of Kavanaugh homology theory for uh, for tangles. So the first approach that I want to give you is due to um, Kovanov. and the relevant paper is this one. And in this um, approach, he studies what he calls MN tangles. Now, an MN tangle is a tangle with a, a definite bottom and a definite top to it. So at the bottom, so this is an MN tangle. And at the bottom, we have two M points. And at the top, we have two endpoints. And then between the two, um, we have a tangle. So it might look something like this. Oops, I shouldn't. Should be no intersections, of course. 
So there's a typical uh, MN uh, tangle. And based on an MN tangle, what happened? Obviously, this doesn't matter too much, but something did happen to my tangle. There, I think that's okay. From such a, a, a diagram, you can again make a make a cube. Um, so how do we go about doing that? Um, so there is a cube of resolutions as before, or a, you know, so if <coughs> we start with a a subset of, of crossings of such a diagram, um, then what we associate to that, well, first of all, we follow the same rule as um, previously. So we follow the rule that I've written up there, which is why I wrote it up. So we follow the rule that we, we have for um, ordinary Kovalev homology in order to resolve all these crossings according to whichever subset we have. Um, and then what we do is we take the, so this is the algebraic thing that I'm associating to that subset. We take a direct sum of some uh, variable, so it looks very much like what we had before. And again, these are truncated polynomial algebras. Um, but what's the direct sum over, and how do I get circles? Because clearly some of these things end, and that's resolved by knowing what this direct sum is over. And this direct sum is over all um, ways of, all possible ways of closing up the top and the bottom of that diagram. So the direct sum is over closures um, of the tangle, where I mean something looking typically like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you have to have some pairing like this. So that's just one uh, possible way of closing up that tangle. And then you have a, a sum and for uh, all possible ways. And once you do that, once you close up, then of course it does make sense to say we have circles in the resulting resolution. Um, and we assign uh, the thing that we assigned before, in fact. Now, it turns out that um, if you do this, that this thing that you've associated to uh, a cube vertex is a bimodule. It's an HMHN bimodule. Where HI is a certain family of rings. Now, I don't particularly want to go into much detail about what these H, I, are. Um, the, way you, the way you get them, if you like, or I mean, what's, very briefly, what's H, N, say? What H, N is, is it's the thing you get if you take all possible top and bottom closings of two n of two n points. And then you assign something like this. Well, my lectures are supposed to be a guide more than anything else, so um, I don't, let me not say, say more about that. There is this family of rings. The point is that um, now you have additional structure, you have bi a bimodule structure, um, and that's the bit that's going to reflect that the gluing, okay? So um, the theorem which you find in, that, uh, in the paper of Kovanov um, is the following. I'll, I'll just summarize the results. If you have isotopic tangles then the complexes that you build in this way, so once you've got that 
uh, the, the, the functor, which means associating like this, then what you do is you, of course, you, you, you extract a cube. Um, it's, you extract a complex um, in the way that I explained for odd Kovala homology once you've got such a functor. If the tangles are isotopic, then the resulting complexes, C of T1 and C of T2, um, they're homotopy equivalent. So there's your um, invariance. And also this construction is um, functorial, again up to plus or minus one. Um, and Kovanov proves that in a, another paper, which I'll give you the number of. And then finally, um, the third point, which is the point about composition, which is the, really the, the new thing. Um, if we have a, a composition of tangles, so if we have a tangle um, T2, which way have around over here? T2 and T1, where I've got here K, M, and N points, or 2K, 2M, 2N, then this one is a uh, HK, HM bimodule, and this, is, this one's an HM, HN bimodule. So I can take the tensor product, and taking the tensor product is the right thing to do. So this has the, uh, this is homotopy equivalent to just C, T2, tensor C, T1, where the tensor product is over, is over HM. Okay, well, if you, um, if you like that, there, there, those are the papers to go and read. Um, there's another approach to tangles, which I want to tell you about now, which is somewhat different. And this other approach is due to um, draw Barnatan. And the reason I need to tell you about that, uh, um, Firstly, it's a very nice, it's a very nice construction. It's a very nice idea, um, so it's worth telling you in any case. Um, but also, it's become very influential, um, and so there's a, a, a non-trivial part of the literature which uses his point of view. So it's useful to know what it is, so you can read certain papers. So the <coughs> reference. So this is Barnatown's approach. And the reference is 0410495. It's really a very nice, um, very nice paper. So what does Barnatan do? Um, well, remember that what we had to do in order to make a, uh, to build Kovana homology is we had to build a functor like this effect. And the way we did that is we took a, well, I guess it's still on the top board. We took a, um, a subset. And the first thing we did was we made the resolution or the smoothing according to those rules which are still up on the top of the board. So that was uh, step one, was we got somewhere here, we got the smoothing. And then from that smoothing, um, we did something, uh, something else uh, to get a vector space. And Barnatan's point of view is to take this two-step process rather seriously. So you break it up into two steps. Now, the first step is to give yourself a functor from the this poset here to some category of cobordisms, a one plus one cobordism category. And then the second step is to do our second step, which is to associate the algebraic thing. And the first step 
indeed consists of associating a bunch of circles to a given resolution. And we also have to do something with the edges. But the thing you do with the edges, you see, you always have, um, if you have an edge from here, you always have a local change, um, which looks like this. This changes to this. And geometrically, it's rather easy to fill this in. You just say that whenever you see this, this is going to go away somewhere and go away. What you do is you fill this in geometrically with a, a saddle like this. So there is a way of getting now a cube of geometric information. And then from that, um, you can get the algebraic information. And this last step is really applying a, a 1 plus 1 dimensional TQFT to the geometric cube. So what's the idea other than that it's a two-step process? Well, Barnatown's idea is that you should stick with this part of the construction for as long as possible. And the way you manage to stick to that part of the construction for as long as possible is that you have to make some kind of sense of being able to build a complex, not with algebraic data, but with data which lives in this more geometric setting. So what he tells you to do is you're supposed to add just enough algebra, add enough algebra to make sense of the complex extraction process. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we had a, a decorated cube like before, there's a simple one, a square, the first thing we did is we took the direct sum over, these, um, over a fixed um, co-rank. And the direct sum operation is something that's missing from here. So we have to fix that. And we fix that by just allowing ourselves to take formal sums of, um, <coughs> of objects in here. Another thing we had to do when we started trying to define the differential is um, we saw that um, well, for a start, the differential had to be differential. So we, we, we wanted to say things like d squared is equal to 0. So 0 has to mean something. Um, we also had signages and, and so forth, which meant we had to multiply by minus 1. Anyway, what we really have to do is we have to be able to take linear combinations of our, um, of our morphisms. But again, you can do that. You can do that formally. So you, uh, you, you by enlarging your category um, in that way, formal sums of objects, linear combinations of morphisms, um, you can build a complex. So what he then does is he defines a formal complex which is denoted usually like this, um, to s which is associated to a tangle uh, T. Um, and of course, if you do this, you can no longer go. You can no longer take homology. Um, what we did to get Kovanov homology is we did all this business of extracting a complex, and then it was a it was a complex of, um, of vector spaces. So we had kernels and co-kernels, and we can take homology. Now we can't. We're working in the slightly strange enlarged cobordism category. We can take linear. Op um, combinations of morphisms, but we don't have kernels and co-kernels, so we can't take homology. Um, but never mind. Um, the point is, and the, the first theorem in this theory is that if you take um, tangles, and now I don't, I'm not restricting to the kind of MN tangles um, that uh, Kovanov was considering. I'm really considering tangles in general of the so sort up the top right. So. If you have uh, isotopic tangles, uh, then the associated 
uh, formal complexes are homotopy equivalent because that uh, makes sense in this slightly strange setting. But now the beauty of this approach is that because we work because we are working geometrically, the gluing still works well. So this is really where the the payoff of this approach comes. Um, we delay the algebra for so long. If it, we don't even need to do the the last algebraic step. If we stick here, it's still geometric enough so that the um, composition of tangles works well. So what is the uh, co combinatorics of tangle composition? Well, it comes in the form of a planar algebra. So what's a planar algebra? Um, well, it's easy to describe what this is for, um, for tangles, so <coughs> I'll do it there. Um, so to each D input uh, arc diagram, uh, which is something like this, so let's call it D, Um, will I be able to do this? So this is an example of an arc diagram. Oops, no it's not. Well, I guess you get the idea. So it's a, it's a some bunch of circles, one outside circle, some circles, some missing disks, and some arcs uh, joining them like this. And to each arc diagram like this, I um, associate an operation. And the operation that I associate is a kind of plugging in the in the missing gaps operation. So such a diagram um, defines an operation which I'll also call D, which takes as input D tangles and it outputs for me a bigger tangle. And the operation um, is just you, the, 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 the input tangles get plugged into these holes. So I'm missing some information here. The information is you have to keep track of how many um, how many points you have on the boundary of each of these circles, um, and you you have to make sure that the thing you want to plug the number of points on the boundary is the right thing. But if you do that, um, you uh, have something like this, and this is kind of the defining example for this sort of structure, and th these are subject to certain. Um, various composition rules, so subject to various conditions. So the category of tangles, almost by definition, admits a planar algebra structure. But what's also true is that the category of those formal complexes that I was defining also admits the structure of a planar algebra. 
So formal complexes also lead to a planar algebra. And I don't particularly want to tell you why, because you're just better reading it in Barnatan's paper. It's a kind of way of, well, of, of taking some the, 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 the input cubes, if you like, and assembling them into one bigger cube. But the result behind this then is that, so this is again Barnatan, is that um, the construction of a formal complex, so um, from tangles to uh, formal complexes, so it takes a tangle T to this thing, this preserves the planar algebra structure. So this is a morphism of planar algebras. So a corollary of that um, is that it's enough to specify what happens at crossings. Yes? Tangles a category with um, cobordisms as, as morphisms. Tangle cobordisms, just like links have link cobordisms, tangles have tangle cobordisms. Um, Yes, so all tangles, if you're given a planar algebra structure, all tangles can be built up from just a single crossing because you can always take um, the input diagram which has a little circle around each crossing. So the, the remark is that everything comes from the complex associated to Just a very, very simple tangle. Of course, you're putting the, the difficult bit elsewhere. You're putting the combinatorics into the combinatorics of the planar algebra structure. Um, but nonetheless, um, this is um, a very, very useful um, point of view. So indeed, we do have um, cobordisms in the picture as well. Um, so what happens to those? <laughs> so we've got this um, somewhat complicated but very nice way of dealing with tangles themselves. Um, but indeed there are cobordisms, um, so what happens there? Well, all I want to say about that is that there's a way of uh, merging these two, two pictures. You see, we've now at the level of tangles, we've got a whole lot of these operations, these planar algebra structure operations. But we've got cobordisms between tangles. And cobordisms can be represented in a diagrammatic way as well. So you have to match together the mixing around that you have with the planar algebra and what happens is you go down the cobordism um, and you end up with a um, somewhat complicated structure and I'll just write down the, the, the name so you have cobordisms. Can we deal with those in this picture? And the answer is yes and the key word is canopolis. Actually I'm not sure how you're supposed to really pronounce this. Canopolis maybe. Um, and this is a, the structure which, as I said, helps fit together um, all the things that you <coughs> have as ingredients. Okay. So one remark I want to make about this, and then I want to, to, to move on, um, is that you can, um, you might ask how do you fit odd Kovana homology into this picture. And actually, you can do that, but you have to do additional work. So 
Um, a reference for that um, is a paper by uh, Chris Putira, which is this. Um, so he extends this picture of, of Barnatan uh, to the set to two categories. So he, he adds even, even more information, and the fact that he has these two morphisms in his two categories allows him to keep track um, of the additional information that came up in the odd Kovala homology. Um, so there is also a way of, um, of including that in this, in this setting. Okay. Well, so much for tangles. Um, what about varying the construction of Kovala homology? I talked, I said to you before at the beginning that we would want to generalize it. Um, but before we talk about generalizing it, what about just varying it? So, how would we go about varying? Um, the, the input that we have for Kovalev homology. Well, as I told you at the beginning, and I think it's still up there on the, on the top board, yes, we associate um, these truncated polynomial algebras to um, <coughs> a given subset of the, of the crossings. And in particular, that means we take, we make this decision to take x squared always equal to zero. And why do we do that? Um, well, one reason is that it makes things work for Kovala homology, um, but there are other possibilities as well. Now, you see that decision there to make x squared equal to zero for all the all the variables. In a way, it it stems from the fact that the um, Kovanov homology of the unknot, which is just a polynomial algebra on one variable, let's say x squared equals zero. Um, well, this is a this is a ring. I, I said that at some point early on, um, and the the ring structure is such that x squared is equal to zero. But I can make other choices for that. So I can try to replace um, x squared equals zero with something more general. So I'm thinking about this equation here as taking place in this ring here. So it's a very minor change, if you like. It's a kind of I'm perturbing Kovalev homology in some way. Now the <coughs> first case of this, which is a, a very um, special case for for many reasons, um, is the case when uh, h is equal to zero and t is equal to one. So then x squared is equal to 1. Now this, the resulting uh, theory, you can do everything that we've done previously. You can make the construction of Kovana homology. Everything works out nicely. And this is called um, Lee theory, and here's the reference. 0, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 3. But there are a couple of things to um, say about this theory. Um, the second grading, which I never talked about very much, although it did appear as a key thing in the long exact sequences, um, the second grading doesn't work very well. It does work well if you grade um, T and H. If you have a graded ring and you appropriately grade T and H, then you can get a bigraded theory. But if you're just working over um, say the rational numbers, and you're thinking of that as an ungraded uh, ring, uh, then you lose that second grading. 
So Q, we'll, we'll consider the case we're working over Q, and it's going to be ungraded. We could decide to put some grading on, put Q in a different spot, but let's just imagine it's um, <coughs> Q is regarded as ungraded. Uh, then what this means is that Lie theory is only singly graded. But other than that, you get a, a very similar invariant out in the sense that it's, it is invariant, um, it's uh, functorial up to plus and minus one, and so on. But there are two very important things about Lie theory. The first is that unlike Kovalev homology, it can be completely calculated. And the other important fact about it is that even though you, use, you lose that second grading, in fact, it's a filter theory. There is a filtration. So let me tell you about the calculation. So theorem, which is found in the paper cited uh, maybe behind this board. Um, so if k is a knot, then the Lie theory in degree i of k is given as follows. It's two copies of q in degree 0, and it's trivial everywhere else. Okay, so um, that doesn't look awfully promising. It's, it's not a particularly good knot invariant. It may be invariant, but it's not a very good knot invariant. Um, if you have a two-component link, L, then the calculation looks like this. Uh, you have two copies of Q in degree zero and somewhere else, and that somewhere else is the degree which is given by the linking number of the two components. And it's trivial elsewhere. And in general, the dimension, the total dimension of Lie theory um, for a, for a, a k-component link is 2 to the k. And there's a very explicit way of finding out what the degrees of the generators are. And just like for uh, two components, um, 
it depends on the linking numbers. It depends on some linking numbers. So probably if it weren't for the existence of the second point up there, which is that it's a filter theory, this would be the end of, um, of this theory. Although possibly not, because it has one thing um, going for it, which is that, as well as that, which is that it is nonetheless a functor. Okay, it might be um, <coughs> determined in terms of um, rather easy and classical information, but nonetheless um, it has functorial properties which um, could be overlooked. But its real redeeming feature is that it has this filtration and whenever you have a filtration it leads to a spectral sequence and this one is particularly interesting. So the filtration leads to the Lee-Rasmussen spectral sequence. So it's somewhat implicit in the, in the paper of Lee, which I uh, cited before, um, and then Rasmussen um, picks up this ball and really um, runs with it. And the first one is in this paper, 0, 4, uh, 0, 2, 1, 3, 1. So the statement of the, the existence theorem for the spectral sequence is this. So there exists a spectral sequence whose E2 page is given by, well, everything's rational. So rational uh, Kovana homology um, is this 2P? Yeah. And it converges to the Lee theory. Now, maybe this is uh, plus gamma, where gamma is the mod 2 number of components of L. So this is the number of components mod 2. So usually, um, you think of spectral sequences as starting with something that you uh, might know about and converging to something that you want to know about. But there are um, a number of examples where you do things the other way around. You have a spectral sequence where you start the, at, the, at an early page with something that you want to know, um, and you end up with something that you do know, and then by some kind of reverse engineering, you can work out something about um, the thing that you first thought of over here. And that's exactly um, the use of the spectral sequence, and it's the situation we're in, because we know exactly what this thing um, has at its E infinity page. Ah, I should maybe tell you about the differentials. So the, um, the differentials um, well, have the form they, they always do, uh, which means this, but it's worth writing down so you can convert this to the grading which um, you have in Kovana homology. And there's one other thing to say about the spectral sequence which is very important, which is that it starts out at the E2 page with a link invariant, and it ends up with a link invariant. Um, so you can ask, are all the pages in between link invariants? And the answer is yes. 
So each page of the spectral sequence is a link invariant. Thank you. So while I'm rearranging the board, uh, you can work out what the by degree of the differential is if you draw it on the page of Kovana homology, if the index corresponds with Kovana homology. Okay, well, let me tell you. So, regraded Oops. So, this means in terms of Kovalev homology, that's the gradings that we see in the kind of just the IJ grading that we have of <coughs> that we see. Um, the differential dr has by degree uh, 1 to R. And one other fact about this is that dr or d odd, so when R is odd, um, the differential is just 0. This is just something to do with the the filtration and the indexing that I'm using. The filtration is that you never jump up one step in the filtration, you'll always jump up two steps. Um, so, for example, if we take the knot 6 1, then its Kovala homology looks like this. This is minus 9, and this is minus 4. So you can fill in the rest of the gradings yourself. The picture looks like this. I can't remember if this is the example I used in the notes or not. Maybe it is. Um, looks like this. There, so there is the Kovalev homology of that uh, knot. And this picture now, so this is I and this is J, and we the differentials on such a picture, the differential in the spectral sequence, the first one um, that is non-zero is D2, and it looks it goes from here to here. D3 will be uh, zero. D4 will jump up eight places, but I'm, remember, as before, we're just missing out all the even J gradings. Uh, so, so D4 will look like that. And in this example, uh, what happens is that just at the E2 page, this, these two generators get killed with D2. Same thing happens here. So these are all D2s. This kills one of these, so it leaves us with one. And nothing happens to this, and this kills this one. So when all is said and done, um, the next page of the, or the E4 page, I guess, according to my indexing of the spectral sequence, just leaves one generator here and one generator there. These yellow dots here, these were just to indicate the gradings of the differentials. They have nothing to do with the rest of the picture. No.
Okay, so why I said that this spectral sequence was useful but by a process of reverse engineering. So I want to give you an example of that. So if you try to calculate the um, unreduced Kovana homology of a trefoil, and you try to do it in the way that I was encouraging you in the first lecture, namely you use the existence theorem. So you use the, you use the long exact sequence. You don't use the definition. If you're trying to do this using reduced theory, um, then you can do it and there's no problem whatsoever. On the other hand, uh, if you're trying to calculate the unreduced theory, then at a certain point you run into trouble. And the trouble you run into is that a, a boundary map, a co-boundary map in the long exact sequence is either zero or it's not and you don't know which. So you end up with a situation where you have two possibilities and here are the two possibilities. Um, well here's one of them. I'll just put a dot to mean a, a copy of Q. So that's one possibility. corresponding to the appropriate differential um, being, I guess, um, is it non-zero or zero, one or the other. And the other possibility looks like this. And you would like to know which it is. But you'd also like not to have to actually wade into the explicit definition of Kovanov homology and see what the differential does. Uh, usually with spectral sequences, you hope that there's some alternative way and you don't have to do any calculation or nothing explicit. And this is exactly what happens here. Because you see, it cannot be um, this picture on the left. It simply can't be. And the reason is because it's inconsistent with what the Lee Rasmussen spectral sequence is supposed to do. Because the Lee Rasmussen spectral sequence at the E infinity page, it will leave two generators in degree zero. And there they are. And everything else needs to get killed by the differentials. But if you take this element here, that I've put a yellow square around and you look at all the outgoing differentials, well, here's D2, here's D4, and so on. And if you look at all the ingoing differentials, there's D2, D4 comes from down there, and so on. But there's nothing in here, and there's nothing in here, which means that there's no differential which could potentially kill off this element. So this simply can't be right, okay? So that means that the conclusion is that this is the right answer. So that's the kind of reverse engineering that you can do using that spectral sequence. And there are other spectral sequences, which I hope to talk about at some point, um, again due to Rasmussen, where this kind of idea really gets pushed even further. There are whole families of spectral sequences um, and the existence of certain differentials or the knowledge of what is supposed to happen um, gives you uh, quite um, some constraints on um, the overall form of what the thing should look like.
So the next thing I um, don't want to talk about is functoriality. There, so now I don't have to talk about it. But actually I will say a tiny bit about functoriality just to give you some uh, references. I said, I said before that if you're looking at the integral version of Kavana homology, then um, uh, up to plus or minus one, showing that it's a functor is okay. Well, that's been done, um, and I'll just write the numbers down. So um, there's the paper by uh, Jacobson, which is this one. There's also the paper by Kovanov. And then uh, the paper of Barnatan, which I referred to before, where in a, in a, uh, the most organized way, in some sense, he um, proves that Kovana homology, all these variants, are um, functorial up to plus or minus one. And getting rid of that plus or minus one um, is not easy. And I just want to give you the references so you can go and look at them if you want. So there's this paper by um, Clark, Morrison, and Walker. Um, there's also some work by Carmen Capral. And there's also an approach um, due to Christian Blanchet. So these ones, you actually have to work over Z, I, and this one I think is over Z. Can anyone, are oh, you there, yes. I, uh, after my experience of trying to look for someone in the audience the other day, I hesitated not to. Okay, good, so Christian uh, confirms that this is um, working over, over Z. Hello, Lucas, I see you're here today, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so the next topic is, um, is generalizing Kovana homology. And um, as we've been learning, um, or, or perhaps as you know, but also if you've been listening to Tang Li, you'll know that there's a general process um, by which if you start with a Li algebra and then pass through um, quantum groups, um, out the end comes a, comes a knot invariant. And as Tang has been telling us, if you take the Lie algebra to be SL2 and you use the two-dimensional representation, then out comes the Jones polynomial. So of course the natural question is what happens if you vary that data? Is there a story for Kovan homology um, for all these other Lie algebras, for all the other representations, and so on. So this is quite a, a big um, chapter, and um, I'm going to say something about the bits which are uh, most closely related to the things that I've already said. Um, and the... Yes, maybe I'll quickly say something about this. So the first topic, which actually I won't talk about at any length, is um, colored Kovanov homology. So Tang has been talking about the colored Jones polynomial, and he's been telling us um, that that's what you get if you stick with SL2, um, but you use the higher dimensional representations. So there is a version of um, colored Kovana homology, and again, I think I will just give you the, the references. Yeah, so at the moment, maybe just two references. So there's this paper by Kovanov, where he defines it. And then there's also a 
reasonably early paper by um, Anna Beliakova and uh, Stefan Verli. So that's where you should maybe start if you want to find out about that. The first Lie algebra that we might be tempted to try once we've done SL2 is, of course, SLN. So SLN homology. This is due to Kovanov and Rosansky. So it's definitely a good place to start because the case n equals 2 has already been done um, and the SLN polynomial um, is well understood in elementary terms as a, as a specialization of the Homfly polynomial. So let me just <coughs> present you with an existence theorem, a little bit like I did for um, Kovanov homology. So there exists. A functor, although actually it should be, let's call it a projective functor because there's still this plus or minus one business, um, from links to rational vector spaces. Uh, satisfying the following things. Uh, firstly, it's an invariant, so if sigma is an isotopy, then the induced thing is an isomorphism. Uh, secondly, um, <coughs> disjoint unions are, are nice, so I guess this is KRN. The value of the unknot I'm going to give you, and it's this, so K R N I J of the unknot is a copy of Q when I is zero and J is two K minus N minus one, where K ranges from one up to n, and it's zero elsewhere. And, fourth point, there are some long exact sequences, which will go on another board. So here are the long exact sequences. There are two cases, um, the first for negative crossings. And it looks like this with the appropriate gradings. Okay. 
So this is the co-boundary map. And then coming in here, here's again a co-boundary map. And here I have this. Like that. And then if I have a positive crossing, uh, there's a similar uh, long exact sequence which has indexing like this. There. So these are the long exact sequences for uh, this theory. Now, when I wrote down the long exact sequences for um, Kovana homology, there was something a little bit not right, and the, the little thing that wasn't right was that whereas one of the, whereas two out of the three pictures I drew really made sense in the category of oriented links, namely they were visibly oriented. Uh, one of them um, didn't. Um, there was no canonical orientation to, to choose. So there was something slightly um, fishy about it. But here, there's something really worthy of saying, whoa, what's that? Okay, so here we have a completely different thing. Okay. So what's going on is that, in fact, um, you need to enlarge your um, category of objects to I include these things. Okay, so the the domain um, of kovanov rosansky homology is um, singular link diagrams where I'm allowed to have crossings that look like this, this, and like this. Now, if we let PND be equal to the following polynomial in Q, minus 1 to the i, Q to the j, dimension of KRNIJD, then we can play the same kind of trick with these long exact sequences as we did for the Jones polynomial, uh, sorry, as we did for Kovana homology in order to find the Jones polynomial, namely getting rid of the bit we don't like, this bit and this bit. So a similar computation to the one I did on day one uh, reveals the following thing, that Q to the minus N PN of a positive crossing minus Q to the N PN of a negative crossing um, plus Q plus Q inverse of PN of the oriented resolution is equal to zero. And also, uh, you can write down um, what PN of the unknot is. Well, I told you what PN of the unknot is. It's, it's over there. So it's the, it's the sum going of K going from 1 to N of q to the 2k minus n minus 1, um, which is q to the n minus q to the minus n over q minus q inverse. And perhaps writing, perhaps up, up to having a, this being n over 2 or something, um, this, is, this is quantum n. Uh, and this relation here, along with this normalization, um, this is exactly the SLN polynomial. So if we can construct a, 
a, a functor as advertised in the existence theorem, then it'll stand in the same relationship to the SLN polynomial as Kovana homology does to, um, to the Jones polynomial. Things, however, are going to be a little bit more complicated um, because while we can still build a, a cube of uh, resolutions, our resolutions will now involve these uh, singular crossings. So that means that we can't reduce everything to um, a single object, a circle. Our um, resolutions will actually be certain four-valent planar graphs. Okay, very good. So I think... Um, Despite having uh, more to say about this, I think I should most definitely stop uh, here for today.